Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Vienna looks absolutely lovely today, and I have had a little bit of time to walk around. What a gorgeous place. I'd like you to start by imagining that you have 2,000 satellite TV dishes. You join them together with good quality cable. You plug them into an excellent receiver and you point them at a carefully chosen part of the sky. Might then, if you listened with headphones, hear something like this. It sounds like a tractor, a truck, but actually it is a star a star of mass a thousand million, 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 million tons, all spinning 11 times every second. It's what we call a pulsar, which is short for pulsating radio star, or it's sometimes called a neutron star because it's a star that is rich in neutrons. To show you how these stars fit into the birth, life and death of stars, I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to concentrate on big stars, bigger than our sun, maybe 20 times the mass of our sun. And so that you can see these slides, I'm going to turn the lights down a bit for the next few slides. This is a picture of part of the constellation of Orion. It's what's known as the Horsehead Nebula because of this shape, like a horse's head. What you're actually seeing is some of this dark material which sticks up, protrudes, and you're seeing it against this pink glow of hydrogen gas. Whenever in astronomical photographs you see pink or red material, it's hydrogen. 95% of the time it is hydrogen. Hydrogen with its red spectral line. It's in these dark areas which are rich in gas molecules and dust. It is in these places that new stars form. These Dark clouds cut out a lot of light. Can you see that up here there are many, 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 many stars, but down here, very few? Because this cloud cuts out the light from the stars behind it. You only see the stars this side. And here and in here, stars are formed. This is another constellation, a group that you can see in the winter sky. It is a group of stars called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. These are very bright stars. They are young by astronomical standards, less than a hundred million years old. But they are stars that are young and will die young. They are like the young man in the sports car. <laughs> very bright, very flashy, no money in the bank, and it does not last. These stars are big, their central temperature is higher, the reactions go faster, and the stars burn out quickly. These are stars that die young. This is a group of stars that you cannot see from Vienna. They are in the southern hemisphere. It's a group of stars called the jewel box because some of the stars show colours. Perhaps people near the front can see that this star has a red-orange colour. It's a star that is getting old. It is past its prime. It is showing signs of age. 
one day the sun will do that as well. And if you notice it, you might tell somebody because it begins to get dangerous for us on Earth. <laughs> Stars like our sun will ultimately die this way. The outer layer made of hydrogen, you see the pink red? The outer layer escapes from the surface of the star and travels out into space. This is the original star. This one is nothing to do with the story. This original star has now shrunk. It is what we call a white dwarf. It's no longer producing energy. It's quietly cooling and dying. And that's how our sun will finish. When our sun does that, we need to find another place to live. But that is five billion years away, so no rush. <laughs> Let's go back to these big stars. They're important for our story. When they reach the end of their lives, they do something much more spectacular. This is a photograph, again, Southern Hemisphere. It's what's called the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's named after the explorer Magellan. You see lots of pink hydrogen, lots and lots of stars, a glowing mass of gas and stars. And down here, one of the little stars picked out with an arrow. Let me be absolutely clear, the arrow was added after the photo was taken. <laughs> Astronomy is not so easy. But watch that corner of the photograph. This is the inconspicuous star that we had to pick out with an arrow. It has exploded, catastrophically totally exploded. We used to think that in the explosion everything got wrecked. We now know that the central 5% of the star remains. That in the explosion that central part of the star has been squashed and it makes one of these pulsars or neutron stars. The rest of the star the 95% travels out into space. This is the remains of a star that exploded about a thousand years ago. It's known as the Crab Nebula and there is a pulsar in it about here and the pulsar is keeping the nebula shining. The pulsar is providing energy to keep the nebula shining. And this is part of the remains of a star that exploded 10,000 years ago. The center of the explosion is away, away to your left, maybe about there. And over there, there is a pulsar, and it's the one you heard at the beginning, the one that sounded like a truck or a tractor. In the 10,000 years, the gas that used to surround the pulsar has expanded out to here. All the time as it expands, it's getting thinner and harder to see. In 100,000 years, it will be invisible. <coughs> this exploded material is important for our life. In your body, there is, I hope, oxygen, calcium in your bones, iron in your bloodstream. The atoms in your body of oxygen, calcium, carbon, iron, were created inside these exploding stars and distributed through space like this. And some of that material got gathered up to make our sun 
and the planets and us. So almost all the atoms in your body have come from stars. You are made of star stuff in a big way. Just fulfill that, that's all. I've already mentioned their huge mass, thousand, million, 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 million tons. They have a radius of about 10 kilometers. And no, I have not made a mistake. I do not mean 10 to the power something kilometers. I mean 10 kilometers. Take a thimble, a sewing thimble, preferably a nice silver one. Take the population of the world, 7 billion people. And one at a time, jam those people into the thimble. When you have all seven billion people in the thimble, the thimble weighs as much as it would if it were filled with pulsar material. That's how heavy, how dense it is. And because there is so much material in a small ball, there's some interesting physics. The gravity at the surface of this star is big. If there were some mountains on the surface of the star, just one micron, one millionth of a meter high, the work you would do climbing this micron on the surface of one of those stars is the same as the work you do climbing Mount Everest here on Earth. And because the gravity is very strong, the atmosphere is also compressed. It's a few, few centimetres deep. So if I'm standing on the surface of one of these stars, the atmosphere is around my toes. It doesn't get any higher than my ankles. And if I want to breathe, I have to get my nose down at floor level. If we lived on a pulsar, we would be different shapes. <laughs> also, gravity, strong gravity, bends light. So you can see over the horizon on one of these stars. Stand in just one spot and look around, and you can see 20 or 30 degrees over the horizon. You see two-thirds of the star just standing in one place. That must feel very peculiar. Gravity also redshifts light. So if there were little green men on one of these stars, to us they would look like little red men because of the redshift of the light. And gravity also affects clocks. Imagine I go with a big, big clock onto one of these stars. You stay here on Earth with a big telescope so that you can see my clock. When I'm on the surface of this star, my clock does one tick every two seconds. It seems okay to me. I can take my pulse with my clock. It's all right, but that's because the gravity also slows my heart, my pulse, and my metabolism. You, back on Earth, where there's less gravity, can see the difference. There's also a very strong gradient of gravity. Let me try and explain that. I'm coming into land on a pulsar, a neutron star. I'm coming in feet first, because that's the ladylike way to land on one of these stars. And as I come down, gravity is pulling me down hard. But the force on my feet is much bigger than the force on my head, because of this gradient of gravity. And there's a stretching of my body. 
the technical term for this stretching is spaghettification. <laughs> but the difference in the force on my head and my feet is so strong that the spaghetti breaks. Your body gets torn apart. And even if I curl up in a ball as small as I can, the extra force on the lower part of my body compared with the top part of my body rips my body apart. So don't go visit a pulsar. There is also an enormous magnetic field, apparently. It's about 100 million Tesla. To put that in context, maybe at home you have some magnets on your fridge. Those magnets have a magnetic field of about one hundredth of a Tesla. And in a laboratory, physicists are very pleased if they have a magnet that is about 10 Tesla. These stars are a hundred million Tesla. And if you spin a magnetic field, you get a voltage drop. And the voltage drop in these cases can be about a thousand million volts in a centimetre. Huge voltage drop. Imagine going to a pulsar surface and experiencing those magnetic and electric fields. Your metabolism works because the molecules are slightly electrically polarised. They would be zapped by these electric and magnetic fields. So don't go visit a pulsar. And don't take your credit cards either. It's not good for them as well. And all this spins like a solid body. We think the pulse period that we pick up, 11 times a second in the case that we listen to, we think that is the rotation period of the star. We see some pulsars with a rotation period of about one and a half milliseconds, one and a half thousandths of a second. And the slowest one we found has a period of about 10 seconds. Imagine a line of soldiers marching. I think I'm going to move away from this microphone for a moment. I will try speaking up so as people at the back can hear. We have a line of soldiers marching. When they have to go round a corner, the people at the middle are doing this. The people at the outside edge are doing this. They have to go faster at the outside edge. Think of one of these neutron stars spinning. The further out you go, the faster they have to go. But things cannot go through space faster than the speed of light. And for a typical pulsar, you only go out 100 kilometers before you're traveling at the speed of light. So clearly a pulsar cannot be bigger than 100 kilometers radius. And actually we think they're more like 10 kilometers. The picture we have of a pulsar today goes like this. Here in the middle is the 10 kilometer radius massive star. It's spinning about its axis. So there's its north pole and its south pole. You know that on Earth, magnetic north is not at true north, it's offset. Similarly on a pulsar. So there is true north, here is magnetic north, magnetic south. And these lines are the magnetic field. But near the magnetic poles, the field lines go away, way out, a long way before coming back round and joining on here. So at the poles, there is this kind of trumpet shape, cone. And we believe that somehow, we're not quite sure how even yet, a radio beam comes out 
of this coal and out of this coal. And as the star spins, this radio beam gets swept around the sky. And so does this one. And if the orientation is right, sometimes we'll have pulsars with a radio beam that sweeps across the earth. And each time the radio beam sweeps across the earth, you get a pulse, 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 pulse. Of course, there will be some pulsars, and I'll show that with my laser spot, some pulsars whose beam never shines on the earth and we never see those ones. We think we see about one in five, 20% of all the pulsars. The rest do not sweep their beam across us. Pulsars are very weak emitters of radio waves and we have trouble at the moment seeing the pulsars in the further half, the far half of our galaxy. We are probably seeing the ones in the near half okay, but the ones in the further half are too faint for present radio telescopes. There's a new big radio telescope being planned and that should be able to see all our galaxy. And so, although there are probably pulsars in other galaxies as well, we have very little chance of seeing them at the moment. Now, these pulsars weigh 10 to the power 27 tonnes, thousand million, 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 million. When you get 10 to the power 27 tonnes spinning, it keeps spinning. And it's very hard to make it change. So these pulses keep coming round very, very accurately. These are clocks. They're good to one part in 10,000 million million, 10 to the 16. Which means that a pulsar has changed its period by only about one second since the age of the dinosaurs. They are very good clocks. Nature has now given us good clocks dotted around the galaxy. And we can use them to test Einstein's theory of relativity. This was the very first test, which started in 1974. I won't give you all the details of this, but along the bottom is the date, and they have been monitoring one of the parameters of the pulsar, and these dots are the data. People near the front can perhaps just see error bars on the first few, but quickly the technique gets better. Now these dots are about 50, five zero times the size of the error bar. And the line is the prediction from Einstein's theory of general relativity. The theory looks very good. And for this work, Hulson Taylor got a Nobel Prize. Recently, we have discovered a pair of stars orbiting each other. That's quite common. But both the pair are pulsars. And so far, we only know of one of these, one out of about two and a half thousand. Nature's been quite kind to us because the orbit is almost edge on. It's not like this or like this, but so that we on, we on Earth see one pulsar go behind the other. Very unusual. It's also a very, very close binary. The two stars, the pulsars, are separated by about half the sun's diameter. Incredibly tight and close. So they're going around very, very fast, and the gravity is very, very strong, and they're even better tests of Einstein's theory of relativity. The theory that Einstein produced, we now know is good to within 0.02%. Using this double pulsar system, we've been able to test to that limit. However, the pulsar astronomers are not done yet. 
They're interested in checking out the theory even more precisely, and so the work continues, and the accuracy will get better and better. Now, at this point, I want to go into a different topic about what is inside a neutron star or a pulsar. The physics gets a bit more advanced here. I will try and explain it as I go along. Um, but in case I lose you, let me just say that the structure of one of these stars consists of a very thin shell about one and a half, two kilometers thick on the outside and some very funny, peculiar stuff inside. A bit like a raw egg. Egg shell on the outside and gooey stuff inside. I'm going to talk a bit about some of those different bits, but uh, it does involve some more advanced physics, so this is rather more for those who studied more physics. If you want to follow this up, you can find a picture like this on the web. It's far too busy, too much data for talking about, for teaching with. But if you want more information, go find this picture on the web. It's good. I'm talking with a simpler picture with just a few layers. A crust of iron, a neutron-rich layer, a neutron superfluid, and a core which is full of question marks. Starting with the outside, a rigid crust of iron atoms, iron polymers. Maybe you didn't know that iron could be a polymer. It can where there's a large magnetic field. The magnetic fields here are large, and so the atoms are no longer spherical, but cylindrical. And according to theory by Larmor, they can be narrow cylinders or fat cylinders. And the way you make a polymer is you take a narrow cylinder, a fat cylinder, a narrow cylinder, a fat cylinder, and so on, making this polymer. A bit like the way you put tent poles together, narrow slotting into large. These polymers are non-spherical, <coughs> very non-spherical, and so they bind together. And you end up with a material that has a Young's modulus, about half a million times that of steel, and a density of about a thousand million kilograms per cubic meter. Tough, tough stuff. The next layer in is made of neutron-rich material. And I'm going to explain that with some simple quantum ideas to do with potential wells. Those of you who've ever studied Schrodinger's theory, quantum mechanics, should follow this okay. One of the things that Schrodinger said was that you can imagine atoms to be very narrow wells. And in these wells, the electrons can take certain energy levels only. And in each level, you can put two electrons with opposite spin, starting at the bottom, filling up till you've got all your electrons in these levels. And then somewhere up here, there's a level that's not full because you've already packed away all your electrons below that. Now, imagine going to a denser regime where atoms are packed closer together, or where nuclei are packed closer together. The well gets narrower, and when a well gets narrower, the energy levels go up. And you still have two electrons per energy, but the first empty level is much, much higher up.
Now suppose we have a radioactive nucleus that wants to do what we call beta decay. A neutron wants to turn into a proton plus an electron plus a neutrino. The electron needs somewhere to go. So here we've got the well, uh, two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, so on. The first space is away up here. But the energy of the electron from this radioactive decay can only be so big. That's the maximum it can have. And there's no space. There's no room. The hotel is full. No beds at this level. And the electron cannot get up there. So this decay cannot happen. It is prevented. If this decay does not happen, we keep all our neutrons. No neutrons decay. So the material gets neutron rich. Go in a little bit further still. The well gets narrower still because the density is higher. The energy levels have gone way, way up. And the topmost electron or particle may have enough energy to do something useful. In this case, it is an electron. And what can happen is that you can take a proton plus this very energetic electron plus a neutrino and create a neutron. It's called inverse beta decay. So what had been protons combine with these energetic electrons and make yet more neutrons. So the material is getting richer and richer in neutrons. OK, but there comes a point when the nuclei cannot hold on to all these neutrons. There's too many neutrons for a nucleus and the neutrons start dripping out at what's called the neutron drip point. It's at quite a high density, 4 by 10 to the 14 kilograms per cubic metres. And you begin to get some free electrons roaming around. Now maybe somebody, some of you have learnt about superconductivity. Superconductivity happens when you've got two particles with opposite spins, some distance apart, but a force between them. And that makes them act like a single particle with zero spin, a boson. And that's at the heart of superconductivity. Here we have neutrons, maybe some with spin that way, some with spin that way. If there's a force between them, the two could be considered a single particle with zero spin, a boson, Bose particle. And that leads not to superconductivity, because these are neutral particles, but to superfluidity, no viscosity. So just to make the physics really entertaining inside these stars, we have a rapidly spinning star with some layers of superfluid. Yuck! So, we've talked about the iron polymers, we talked about the neutron-rich nuclei, where beta decay is prevented and inverse beta decay happens. We've talked about an area where the neutrons are, some of the neutrons are loose and make a superfluid. What about the core? By this stage, we're getting well above the density of the nucleus of the atom, three times, five times. And the physics, well, there's a lot of question marks around. So some people have suggested that the core of one of these stars could be solid. Others have said liquid. Some have said they could be made of hyperons. Some have said they could be made of quarks. It's difficult to know because we don't have data on how a material behaves at this density. Um, in addition to the quarks, people have suggested mesons, people have suggested Bose-Einstein condensates. You fancy something? Maybe it's there. 
maybe it's not. We're beginning to get some data. This gets very exciting. This is a graph of the radius of a neutron star against the mass of the neutron star. And these curvy lines show some of the possible relationships between mass and radius, depending on what the star is made of. The green lines assume the star contains strange quarks. The pink lines, nucleons plus other exotic particles. The blue, nucleons. <coughs> and these horizontal lines are some of the heavier, more massive neutron stars we've measured. And the really exciting one is this one at two times the mass of the Sun. And we now have a second one with this mass. And you see these green curves don't really make it up here. The pink curves don't make it up here. And so the authors have said, aha, nucleons only, nothing exotic. And people don't like that, so they fought back the way scientists do. The authors of this paper have carefully chosen a few out of many, many, many possible <coughs> curvy lines that could go on this graph. And you need to stop and ask about some of the assumptions behind some of these. These quark ones, I think, assume that quarks don't interact. Maybe they do. Maybe those lines aren't right. These blue ones don't really properly treat what happens when you get to very, very high density. So maybe they're wrong. So the jury is still out. But we're beginning to get some data which will at least pin down some of the many, many theories that there are around. Right. So that was the heavy physics. Now back to some lighter stuff in conclusion. The name Pulsar. It was invented by the science correspondent of an English newspaper called the Daily Telegraph. He took pulsating radio star and shortened it to Pulsar. And we said, yeah, good idea. And Pulsars they became. But the name has also been given to a model of Nissan car. You can certainly buy these in New Zealand. I'm not sure where else you can get Pulsar cars. In the Netherlands, I found some Pulsar geraniums in a glass house. And of course, there is the watch company that makes Pulsar watches. Quite a good name for a watch. But did you know that in the United States of America, the Pulsar Watch Company tried suing the radio astronomers for use of the name? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the watch company didn't know the history. Are you aware of something called the Guinness Book of Records? Here are some Pulsar records. The pressure at the center of a neutron star is large. <laughs> That's in terms of the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. The fastest known pulsar, it's the pulsar PSR, which stands for pulsar, 1937, which is its longitude on the sky, plus 21 is its latitude on the sky. Fastest known pulsar has this period in milliseconds, thousandths of a second. And look at the accuracy with which it is measured. That is 16 decimal places. And that three at the end is not all experimental uncertainty. When you measure a pulsar period to this accuracy, you find this end number gradually gets bigger. The pulsars are very, very gradually slowing. And this pulsar, if I can get this sound file to work, sounds like this. Mm. 
You don't hear the individual pulses, just the note. And it sounds like a kitchen blender or something like that. However, recently they found another pulsar that goes a little bit faster. 1.4 milliseconds as opposed to 1.6. We haven't the same accuracy yet because we haven't been observing it as long, but with time we will get it more accurately. And this gets very interesting because this is close to 700 revolutions per second, 700 hertz. And there's a theory that says that's as fast as one of these stars can rotate. If it tries going faster, it gets wobbly in the middle it emits what's called gravitational radiation, and that effectively stops it going any faster. So, of course, the hunt is on to find an even faster pulsar and bust the theory. That's the way science works. But at the moment, we're just resting on this borderline. We may have to wait a bit to know whether that theory is right or wrong. The first planets discovered beyond the solar system were planets around a pulsar. This pulsar, PSR 1257-12. We now know there are three planets and also a tiny fourth one. And I'm going to drop the lights again for a moment while I talk about this diagram. This diagram compares the planets around the Sun in this panel with the planets around the pulsar. Here's the Sun, or part of it, and here's the pulsar. And the Sun has planet Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so on. The pulsar has a small planet A, a biggie one B, another biggie one C. And we now know that there's also a little asteroid type thing as well. So these planets around the pulsar are rather closer in than the planets around the sun. It's, it's quite hard to understand why there are planets around a pulsar. Remember that this star was formed through one of those giant explosions. That should clean out the planets very nicely. And a young pulsar has a lethal beam. It's not just radio waves that are going round, it's X-rays and gamma rays as well. And if that were to fall on any planet, it would evaporate the planet very nicely. So it's a bit hard to understand how you get planets round a pulsar. And officially at the moment, we only have this one, but I know that there's another two or three that they suspect have planets. They're just not announcing them yet till they've got more data, and they're sure. The roundest known thing in the universe is the orbit of a pulsar around its companion star. The orbit of the pulsar has a radius of 567,000 kilometers, and the orbit is accurate to five microns. That's a tenth of the width of a human hair. For those of you who like the maths, the eccentricity is about 10 to the minus 7. It is very, very round. And finally, if something falls on the surface of a pulsar, it hits the surface, travelling at half the speed of light. I find that quite hard to believe, but I guess we've got to believe these things. Thank you for your interest.